Hi birders. Hey guys, it's Jim and Steve with earlybirder.net. We're continuing our birding education series. How to bird, how to become an awesome birder, how to be cool like us. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've covered what birding is. And we've covered our salutes video, which is pretty awesome, I think, in remembering what to look for and how to break things down so that you can identify species. And now we're going to cover an equally important video on field guides because if you don't have all that information about what birds are and what they look like and how they behave, you're going to be a little confused. Yep. So we're going to cover all sorts of different books and a handful of different apps that we use to help us identify the species out there and keep growing our list in our pursuit to see every single bird on earth, which should be easy because I don't know, I've seen a couple hundred, 300 plus, and I think there's only like 10, 12, 15,000. 18,000, <laughs> depends on where you look, but yeah. there's lots. There's tens, tens of thousands. The, the number <laughs> is growing and shrinking. Yeah, as uh, strange. They split them up through genetics and everything like that. But in general, when you start, you think, I got to get a field guide. Probably the first kind of thing you're going to end up is a generic field guide for your country. And it's going to be something. This one is National Geographic's Field Guide to the Birds of North America. So this is, in general, going to have most of the birds that you're going to see in anywhere in North America. Right. Um, this one specifically is all of North America. So it's everything north of the Mexican border through Alaska and Canada. Yeah. Um, pay attention when you're getting these, if you're going to buy one, or if you find one somewhere. Sometimes they split it into east and west in your countries, in your areas. Um, so it's important to check that in case you know you think you're getting the full continent and find out later on or find out when it's delivered that it's only half. Right. And probably not the half that you live right. in, which the wrong half would be huge huge disappointing. <laughs> not that it's not good to have both, but uh, these general field guides are good. And this is what you're going to use with the information that you collect, all the evidence you collect in the salute system. You say, okay, now I know what it's doing, where it lives, what it looks like, and now what do I do with that information? And, and these field guides are broken up into sections. Uh, Typically, they start with waterfowl and then go through different water birds and then raptors. And, and the farther you get to the back, you're going to end up with songbirds and things. And a lot of them, like this one, for instance, has little tabs in it. So yeah, the tabs say hawks, sandpipers, gulls, flycatchers, warblers, sparrows, finches, those kind of things. So once you get that first size and shape, you get the silhouette and you say, I know I'm looking at a, at a warbler. Then you're going to just pop open that warbler section and you're going to see something that looks like this. You're going to have information correlating to what they call plates. They're paintings, drawings, photographs, things like that. And all the different field guides will have it set up a little bit different. But, you know, the good ones will have multiple different plumages. And they'll have comparative species on the same page. So these are all different species of birds. And it could be male and female. And then they might throw in a juvenile or something like that. And you're going to show. use... Breeding plumage and non-breeding plumage. Yeah. The, the good ones have lots of different options for you to look like. Yeah. So it'll really help you break it down. Yeah, and then so you're going to be able to use the information that's here, and then you're going to see something that's got a range map on it. And range maps show different color codes, and then they've got all these paint splashes across a map of, in this instance, the continental United States all the way up through Alaska, and it's going to have a winter range, and then it's going to have a migrational range, and then it'll have a summer range. And you're going to look at your country here, and it'll have all the different states or territories in it, and you're going to say, this bird is going through here during migration based off of the color code that it has on there. So I know that during migration, it's possible that I could see that species. And then you're going to be able to use the information you got in the salute system and say, can it be here? Because sometimes you might think it's something and you go to the range map and find it doesn't belong in my state. That isn't to say that it can't be there, 
their accidents happen. But in general, when you're trying to identify something, you're going to want to see, should that bird that I think it is be here? And right. if the answer is yes, you can move on. Especially when you first start, focus on those ones. Yeah. It's really important just to focus on the most common stuff and learning all those common birds so that you know exactly what it is or isn't when you're looking at it. Um, another thing with field guides is uh, this one you see I have a bunch of tabs because this one didn't have the cool quick tabs. So I added them, just little post-it notes that you can pick up at any store. Yeah. Um, the other thing with these is a lot of them have a list in the front where it'll show a bunch of the species or types so that you can reference that really quick mm -hmm. and then turn to the correct page. This particular guide has pictures in it as opposed to drawings and paintings. So you have the actual pictures of the birds. And a lot of times you'll be looking at something and you'll go, ah, I'm just not seeing it because the painting isn't what it looks like in real life. And if you see a real life photograph of it, it'll help you solidify that and go, okay, I see what they were going for in the painting. It makes sense. But in real life picture, it really brings out, you know, the colors or the markings or whatever. Yeah. And then it, it gives a little description. So it has the bird's name. It'll have the Linnaean name uh, for, you know, if you're doing taxonomy or sometimes international birders, they use this Latin name system. So you can know that you're talking about the same species. Uh, you might be in a different country mm -hmm. where you don't speak the language very well, certainly not enough to identify birds, but they use the common Latin names. Yeah. Or the common names in different countries that could be talking about the same species as far as the Latin name goes, but you think it's a different bird because the common name is a little bit different depending on where you're at. And then next, it'll give a quick description on the size. So it'll talk about the length of the bird. It could talk about the wingspan, mm -hmm. uh, those kind of things. And then it's going to give a little description and say, you know, it has these kind of markings. Um, this is where, you know, everything that it looks like. And then it has a description on uh, the voice. Bird guides have given like a, a writing out version of what the song called is. So this one says calls include a musical Tweedle eat. Also a thin seat, if that helps you. Now, anymore, it's a lot easier to use audio recordings of bird calls because... Just, just read it out. It's a, yeah. Tweedle eat. <laughs> That's what it says. <laughs> Yeah, so when you hear it, maybe you can put it together, and then it'll talk about range. Some of them actually come with audio CDs. Mm -hmm. It's not as common anymore because everything's digital yeah. now, but some of them do come with that audio CD that you can rip and download onto your iPad or iPod or yep. phone or whatever. And so you can use that information from the the what you collected in the field. You might carry this around with you and say, I'm looking at this bird. Flip it open, go to your section, identify the bird, and it could be as simple as that. So this is a really handy tool. A lot of these guides, too, like, obviously you can get them online, order them wherever you get your books, usually Amazon or whatever. But a lot of these are available just in random stores. Like, I think I got this one at Lowe's. Um, another good place is just check used bookstores or thrift stores or stuff like that. A lot of people get rid of old books. Like, I started collecting old guides because things have changed so much over the years. So I've got guides from the early 30s, 40s, and 50s and stuff like that. So that's kind of cool. But if you're looking to get into something you really don't have the money or you don't want to spend a lot of money because you're not sure it's going to be you know something you're interested in, you can hit up used bookstores or, like I said, thrift stores where I've found several of these at reasonable prices. Yeah. So something where if you're running that budget route, that's a good way to go about it. Yeah. So then that's just a general guide. And then you might take it another step further because the, you could see in those general guides that for things like gulls or sandpipers, there could be a zillion different varieties of these same species. And the one you're looking at looks similar, but it's not quite right. And so that's where specific guides come in to, into play. Like this one here is a shorebird guide. And, you know, there's what over the entire northern hemisphere there's you know 200 or whatever and some change different species of shorebirds but this will go through a specific species and it'll show it in mixed flocks with different species of birds and then it'll show it in different lighting conditions and different developmental conditions with its age and things like that so it gives you a, a huge amount more information and if you know you're looking at a shorebird and you're in an area where there's tons of shorebirds um, you know, our friends in the coastal areas, 
this would be a really useful tool because a lot of the common birds you're going to be seeing might be down on the on the beach and and having this guide in you know as a team with one of your general field guides might help you become more of an expert in those specific species instead of looking out there and seeing a field of brown and tan shapes mm -hmm. and going oh those are sandpipers you'll be able to pick through them and pick out maybe five or six individual species right. by having a good guide with lots and lots of pictures to really identify those another one we like is uh, the gulls guide because a lot of people look at gulls and they go yep it's a gull yeah but the this will break it down the same way with lots and lots of pictures, mixed flocks, where to see them, where they usually are, behavior, things like that. So, yeah. So that's an, another step. And then species there's... Species-specific yeah. guides. And then there's state-specific guides. Like here we've got... Any kind of region-specific, yeah. not just states. Obviously, we live in the U.S., so we focus on right. states, individual states. But So this per, uh, book here, it's not in print anymore. Uh, it's about, I don't know, 25 years old or so, mm -hmm. the sense it was printed. So the information isn't all accurate anymore because there's so much that changes over time. But when we started, it was invaluable to have this state information because rather than having any birds in it, it's got locations in it. Where to go. Yeah, and so if you are looking and you say, okay, I want to go look at birds now. Where is the best place to go? And you might think the city park or something like that. But oftentimes, you know, there's way better places that are going to just enrich your birding experience. And you want to make sure you're going to the right places because, uh, you know, if your first trip is a place that only has one or two species of birds, you're going to be like, this is not fun right. at all. You don't know the area at all. Maybe you don't know anybody that lives yeah. there. But with a guide like this, you'll be able to go in there and then go to the locations where someone has put in the time yeah. And can say, these are really good locations to go. Like, you're in the country for a week. You want to go find out specific stuff. Like, I have this guide in on continental Portugal where it says, look, these are the places that you want to go if you're in Portugal for, you know, a yeah. couple of weeks on vacation. Here's where you should go. And it doesn't have any pictures, like you said, but it'll tell you locations to go, where to park, and yeah. what to look Directions for. to get there. Like this one, Species for instance, says, when you're there. five miles north of Shoto on U.S. Highway 89, take the Teton River Road west for 17 and a half miles. Watch for, then it lists species, and then it says, then you'll cross this area, and in this area, look for these species. And so these can be really, really helpful. And I've got, you know, one for Hawaii here that, that tells you the different islands and where to see them and what time of year to see certain species of birds. And so if you're going into a location, I like to pick up a book for an area that I've never been before. That way I know what I'm getting into and I, you know, I'm still going to be overwhelmed, but I just feel a little bit more confident having that information there. At least you can study up before you get there. Mm -hmm. You have, you know, a whole different country or continent that you're looking at, like the birds of Europe here. I don't know what I'm getting into, but I know I can start looking through this and identifying mm -hmm. things that are in here, what to look for and the time of year specifically that I'm going there. So you can see I start putting tabs in here based on the time of year that I'm going to be there. I'm putting tabs on those birds that are there that time of year so that I'm only studying up on the birds that are most likely going to be there. Right. That can help, you know, take that feeling of being overwhelmed and reduce it. You know, like this one, it's the same birds of Costa Rica. Again, it didn't have any tabs, so I've got, you know, doves, parrots, cuckoos trogans those kind of things like that and i do this for this is birds of east asia so that's china russia japan when i lived in japan this was like my bird bible when i was over there and it's you know i had gone through and i had made notations on every page and i wrote a number next to birds that i could see in japan and that way, again, I wasn't studying birds that were going to be only in China or Russia. Mm -hmm. And it helped narrow those things down for me. Um, and, you know, we've been talking about this kind of as the partner to the salute system. But as a standalone, obviously, we are not combining this information of birds of Costa Rica with an observation. But we're studying up on it that way. When we get the opportunity to go we see a bird, we're going to remember all the times that we've read through this book and looked at the plates and read the descriptions of them. And your mind has a funny way of pulling things out. So you'll say, 
I think this is a Trogan. I've never seen a Trogan in the United States before, but I know what Trogans look like. And so when you see it, you'll bring back that mental reference. And, you know, if you have these sitting around the house, have them sitting on the table or by the couch in the bathroom, take it to the toilet. It's yeah. great reading material. You know, and and these are the kind of things that you have sitting around. But, you know, say if you're going to go birding in Montana, you might not want to carry all this stuff like that. And with the invention of modern technology and, and magic phones and things like that, they can take something like this and just make it an app that takes up, you know, a few hundred megabytes on your phone. And so that's where we'd like to talk about field guides that are apps. Yeah. And I'll, well, the difference, like we talked about before, between having a field guide in paper, which is great at-home study material, mm -hmm. not so much fun to hike around with in the right. field. Uh, the, the added bonus is that with that app on your phone, you are going to have those audio sounds. So you'll be able to bring that with you and listen and help you identify stuff. Yeah. You, you just won't have it out of a book, like I said. Kind of yeah. made a joke out of it, but reading that stuff is not going to really help you right. most of the time. Sometimes it actually does. Yeah. It's not bad. but No, um, but it's a combination of all the different things. And if you're obsessed with birds like we are, you're just going to want to consume all of that information as best as you can. you got to stay immersed in it, otherwise it starts to leave you like any other skill. Well, with the apps, the some of the benefits that you get with them is that you have a constantly changing uh, data source where you can, like in the National Geographic's app, the, it's called the iBird, um, it'll show on there pictures from the internet and that other people have uploaded. So rather than having a set number of pictures or, or uh, paintings or anything like that, it's constantly expanding. And so you might find one in there that perfectly represents the bird that you're looking at. Um, and also, like you said, it's got the sound, it's got different tools that let you compare different species that are similar. It's got smart searching uh, technology in there where you can say, this is the bill size, this is the color on its head, this is the eye color, this is the leg color. size of the bird. Yeah. So it'll say, is it duck Is size? it on the is ocean? It, yeah. Is Those it kind in the of water? Things. It really helps break it down quicker. Or with uh, the Sibley's Guide, which I've used the longest, you can just select your state and then it'll automatically remove all the ones that shouldn't be in your state. And it still includes some of the accidentals and stuff yeah. like that. So it's not going to completely eliminate your opportunity to kind of figure out those accidentals, mm -hmm. but it does eliminate almost all the stuff that's yeah. just, it's never been reported. Right. It gets rid of a lot of the extras, so then you're not as overwhelmed. And also, most apps that I've used have a built-in listing system, and it'll keep track of, you've seen this bird before and where, and you can do... Um, a GPS location, you can put little notes in there. And so it's really helpful over time. Like I keep my whole North American life list on my Sibley's app. And if I put a bird in there, I don't remember if I'd seen it before, I can just drop it in there. And if I had seen it before at a different time, it'll mark the observation, but it won't increase my life list total because it's already in my life list somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so it's a really helpful resource that helps you reduce carrying around notebooks in the field carrying around field guides and those sorts of things. So it's a really great resource. Um, Another thing that you can do is if you're interested in the more scientific side of things, there are apps specifically for listing species that you've identified and, and counting them and things like that. Like uh, uh, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology puts out um, an app and they keep track of birding migration and stuff like that. Um, for some reason, it slipped my mind what it's called. Was it eBird? eBird. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. eBird. So you can go on there and just go through and list the things that you're seeing in the location that you're seeing it over the period of time that you were there. Yeah. And it keeps track of your movements while you're there and submits that to their huge database. Yeah. And they keep track of all that information to help them identify migratory patterns and things like yeah, that. That's really helpful if you want to participate just like a citizen science scientist kind of thing because then they can go on there and say what does the movement of cardinals look like this year and they can say cardinals and then they'll have like a electronic map of the united states and it'll just <laughs> drop in all these pins and they'll say that's how many times cardinals have been seen so far within a time period and you've helped them collect that data right. so that they can build a map based on the last you know 20 30 years of data that they have 
saying, okay, it looks like, you know, Cardinals have been slowly expanding or slowly shifting their range over this direction. And that information then gets put into guides so they can update the range maps and things like that. So something that was really uncommon to see 20 years ago now is much more common to see. You know, would have never made it on the range map before without that data. Right. And so you can be involved in that. Uh, And there's also different things. If going through all this is too complicated for you, there's also technology where you can just take a good picture and upload it and it'll try and it'll use artificial intelligence to try and give you a bird identification if you want to skip learning how to do all this stuff. But they're not super accurate. But yeah, they're starting to develop that technology. So you guys can look into that. But I mean, in the end, if you're identifying birds and you're enjoying it, you know, it's all for the birds. It's all about the birds. It yeah. really is. So anyways, we appreciate you guys appreciate you guys uh, stopping in and checking out this Guide to Guides. The Guide to Guides. Any kind of questions, comments, throw it in below. We'll see what we can do to answer it. And if we don't know, we'll try and point you in the right direction. So, Thanks for watching. Yeah, see you guys. Keep birding.